Welcome. So welcome everybody to tonight's uh, public physics lecture by Professor Nima Arkani Hamed. So Nima is a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, he's known for his contributions to quantum field theory, which is the fundamental theory of particles and forces, and for his creative proposals for solutions to long-standing long problems in particle physics. Uh, much of his early career focused on understanding why the Higgs particle is so light compared to the Planck scale. This is known as the hierarchy problem and is one of the major unsolved problems in theoretical physics. Uh, as a postdoc, Niba proposed the theory of large extra dimensions to solve this problem. Uh, the idea was that gravity would leak into the extra dimensions, uh, making it weaker than the other forces. At first, this sounds crazy, but he showed it's just crazy enough that it just might work. Uh, and experiments have been searching for those extra dimensions ever since. So this is just one of Nima's many out-of-the-box ideas for solving uh, one of these long-standing problems in particle physics, dark matter, and cosmology. Uh, so I first met Nima at Harvard. Actually, I met him when I visited as a prospective graduate student. So the graduate students in the audience remember what these visits are like. There's a bunch of impressionable young people in an office uh, trying to figure out what to do with their lives. And I remember being in Nima's office, and um, the LHC was about to turn on, and he, he, he told us utterly convincingly um, that absolutely the the thing that everybody needs to do is to figure out what's going to come out of the LHC. Everybody needs to be a particle physicist. And I think everybody in the room, whether, I have no idea what their plans were before that, but everybody came out of that room as a particle physicist. Except you. <laughs> <laughs> I did. No, the story continues. I did too. I did too. Um, but then, and, and then I was a student at Harvard, and I remember at a, at a speaker dinner a couple years later, um, when, when Nima said, well, the problem we really need to crack is emergent space-time. <laughs> Somebody has to solve this problem. So I've been working on that problem ever since. And, and Nima has, too, um, from, from his own uh, unique angle that starts with scattering amplitudes um, and, and realizes space-time uh, as an output, not an input, uh, from that starting point. So he's also... What about what? About what? They all oh. into the ether. <laughs> no, they're people you know. They're people you know. <laughs> Liam Fitzpatrick was in the room. Matt Baumgart was in the room. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, he's also, in that time, been a, been a big proponent and advocate for particle physics uh, experiments. His work has been recognized with numerous prizes, including the Fundamental Physics Prize in 2012. Uh, today, Nima is here. Uh, as the Cornell A.D. White Professor at Large. Uh, his, in his past visits, he's lectured on, on many different topics, and today uh, we'll discuss the point of doing fundamental physics. So please join me in welcoming Neymar Khani Ahmed. It is, uh, is this on? All right, it's truly wonderful to be back uh, at uh, Cornell. Uh, Almost every time I've been here, there's been some young person that I've known since they were you know, wee high who's uh, said nice things about me at these introductions. And anyway, um, uh, uh, Tom was actually nearly my graduate student <laughs> and made a, made a very wise decision not to be. But anyway, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really one of the true pleasures, real pleasures of academic life to watch these people uh, grow into such, such amazing stars and do fantastic things uh, in uh, physics. So thank you for the wonderful, wonderful introduction. Um, every time I've uh, come here to Cornell, going back to when I gave the messenger lectures back in uh, 2010, I think, um, I've been in this room wearing a suit and tie, okay, and giving a presentation. Um, and uh, since I've been coming as the uh, A.D. White uh, professor at large, I was telling people at dinner that I decided to do this because I always wanted to be something at large in my life. I just think it's so cool <laughs> to be something at large, and I can't be any, I'm an academic, so the coolest thing at large I can be is a professor at large. Um, but every time I've come here as a professor at large, I've done a kind of experimental, funny, 
public lecture, which is not the kind of uh, public lecture that you normally do where you talk about the latest thing going on with black holes or cosmology or accelerators and so on. And I thought, this is my last visit as an uh, A.D. White professor at large, and I thought I would do the most experimental thing of all, which is to actually try to have a discussion with the audience. I think it's kind of boring to have people up here all the time just talking, and um, I would like to instigate an interesting discussion about an interesting topic. And um, in order to make sure that this happens, I don't have slides. I'm just going to be up here. Uh, I'm just going to you know, start off making a few general remarks to sort of set some context for the discussion, perhaps. But I really hope, and I encourage you to ask questions. There are no taboos. Ask arbitrarily difficult questions. And um, uh, unfortunately, I think this is being recorded. So if your questions are sufficiently taboo, while I might not care, people around the world might care. You know, but um, anyway, ignore them, screw them, right? Uh, and uh, I hope we'll have some uh, fun. So the subject is, what's the point of basic research? What's the point of basic science? I don't want to make it more, uh, it's already pretty broad. What's, what's the real point of doing fundamental science? Um, uh, after all, the world has all kinds of difficult problems. Why should we devote resources, uh, most importantly perhaps intellectual resources, but financial resources, all the kind of resources that we gather at wonderful universities like this and others around the world, um, uh, devoted to these questions that don't have any obvious practical relevance to the daily lives of, uh, of people, uh, many of whom are suffering, having all kinds of other problems and so on. So why, do we, why should we be doing this? And um, there's all kinds of standard answers to this question. Uh, and I would like to, like to talk about some of them, but sort of push a, little, uh, push a little deeper as well, push back against some of them, expand on some of them, uh, say some of them more extremely, uh, put some caveats on some of them, and have a sort of more uh, meaningful discussion about this very interesting question. Now, this discussion is not just academic for my particular field. Okay? If you're a particle physicist, this discussion about why should we devote resources, blah, blah, has some real teeth to it because every two or three or four decades, we come with our hands out asking some multinational governments for billions of dollars in order to build the next big particle accelerator. Okay? And this is something that's been going on for decades. It's likely going to continue going on for decades, but we're in a period right around now where it's happening again. And the biggest particle accelerator in the world today is the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland. It's around 27 kilometers around. It's done amazing things, discovered the Higgs particle. And the, and we can talk about this at much greater length uh, in the discussions that people are, are interested. But right now, people both in Europe and in China are starting to think about the next big machine after the uh, Large Hadron Collider. And um, whether it happens or not is not obvious, but if it does happen, um, it's going to be, uh, it's going to take the energy and talents of thousands, maybe tens of thousands of scientists and engineers. They're going to work for a period of two or three decades and spend a lot of money. It's not obvious how much money these things cost. I could just say a, a, a little bit. This, this next stage machine would maybe be around 100 kilometers around. Uh, in a first phase, it would uh, collide electrons and their antiparticles, anti-electrons or positrons together and produce millions and millions of these mysterious Higgs particles and study the Higgs particle to death. So that's the first thing uh, that you would do. And then later in the same 100 kilometer ring, you could collide protons the way it's done now at the Large Hadron Collider and then get a glimpse into the laws of nature, roughly a factor of 10 smaller distances, energy a factor roughly 10 higher than we're doing at the Large Hadron Collider today. Okay, so that's the things that uh, people are talking about. The cost of the first sort of machine that just collides electrons and positrons is pretty easy to estimate, and it's around $5 billion. Okay? It's certainly, if they build it in China, it'll be $5 billion. No sugar coating. Okay? The, estimating the cost of the next machine is, is more difficult. Um, uh, you have to make extrapolations based on technology we don't know everything about, but the cost would maybe be certainly tens of billions of dollars. So maybe it's 10, maybe it's 20, maybe it's 30. It's not obvious uh, uh, ahead of time what the number is. So anyway, so that's why this discussion in my particular field is not academic. Uh, not exactly academic, we, we, we have to say, why is it that it's worth doing this thing? Tens of thousands of people, billions of dollars, decades of effort in order to maybe probe what's going on at distances 
a thousand or ten thousand times smaller than the nucleus of the atom, and you get excited if you produce a particle that lives ten to the minus twenty-seven seconds before it decays, <laughs> right? And by the way, and the whole complex takes the like you know the the power of a small city to run. <laughs> okay, so uh, so why are we doing this? Why the hell are we doing this? Why is this a good use of our intellectual and financial resources? Well, of course. Why are we really doing it? Why are those of us who are doing it doing it or excited? Well, first and foremost, um, the, uh, not just for this subject, but for all of us engaged in some kind of uh, basic uh, fundamental research in the sciences, we're driven by, obviously, a very powerful, very deep, and very human curiosity about how the world works around us. Um, in this particular example of particle physics, there is just something sort of viscerally joyful about smashing particles together at the highest energies we have ever done to probe the tiniest distances we have ever done, right? The irony of the largest machines that have ever been built to study the tiniest things we've ever seen is just something kind of crazy and amazing. And, uh, and if you go, uh, and I encourage you, those of you who, who, who ever can, if you go to Geneva, you can sometimes get tours of this big machine. And it's just sort of awesome in the old-fashioned you know, biblical sense of the word. <laughs> You're just sort of filled with awe at the, this, these incredible things that are created for, uh, for human beings uh, to, uh, to uh, pursue these kind of questions that they've been thinking about for millennia. And so, first and foremost, for this kind of thing, we go to the frontier because it's the frontier. We want to look around and see what's there. There's no promises for what we'll find. We have no idea what we'll find ahead of time. Sometimes there's good theoretical guidances for what we'll see. Sometimes there isn't. Sometimes... Sometimes you can expect that you'll produce new particles you haven't seen before. Sometimes you can't. At, at this point, we cannot promise. We have no idea necessarily where the next particles are that will tell us something. All we know is that we have to go look, and there's good reasons for looking uh, very carefully at the, uh, at, the, at the Higgs particle especially. But anyway, that's just, uh, that's just an example in, 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 in my part of science. But sort of more generally, um, again, we can go back to this question. Isn't this all kind of a luxury? in a world that's beset with more pressing concerns. Well, one thing I should immediately say is that when we talk about how much financial, intellectual and financial um, uh, resources um, are involved, we should remember that even as self-absorbed, navel-gazing academics, um, we're not actually talking about such a massive amount, uh, such a massive fraction of intellectual resources and such a massive fraction of financial ones. Uh, even intellectually, sadly, we're not a particularly uh, influential uh, set of voices in the daily workings of the world around us, a fact that's sadly more and more apparent as time goes on. Uh, and as far as, as money goes, uh, you know, even these most expensive things that we're talking about, the things that I was just talking about, they cost, they cost roughly one part in 10,000 of GDP. And they've been costing roughly one part in 10,000 of GDP for decades. Nothing has really changed. They haven't gotten all of a sudden more expensive. Of course, they've gotten more expensive, but we're getting richer at the same time, right? The fraction of GDP these kind of even very large-scale big science experiments cost is roughly the same as they've always been, and even extrapolating for this next stage is not particularly different. So, uh, so it's not such an enormous uh, chunk of the intellectual resources, and it's not such an enormous chunk of the financial ones either. But still, let's come back to the question. It's still reasonable to ask, what benefit does all this basic research give the rest of humanity, apart from our own uh, curiosity? And here there are some well-rehearsed and completely true statements. Okay? So I want to remind the scientists um, uh, who all know this, and the rest of you probably have heard uh, many examples like this, but we often talk about the following wonderful fact. We pursue things for pure curiosity with no thought whatsoever about the applications they might have. And yet, and yet, sometimes 20, 30, 50, 100 years later, they end up having some transformative uh, impact on some aspect of everyone's lives. There are many examples of this going back, uh, going, going back a long, long way, but we can typically we start off telling these stories going back to the mid-1800s. One famous story is some kind of uh, British minister was in Michael Faraday, the great experimentalist's lab, uh, and was asking, Michael Faraday was doing all these funny experiments with electricity and magnetism, what good all of this stuff was. Because, you know, there's some funny materials they don't do, they, they do they have funny electric magnetic properties. Uh, Faraday was busy measuring the fact that the polarization of light could slightly rotate when you pass it through a magnetic field. Who, who gives a crap about these things? So he asked, what good is all of this? And Faraday famously said, I do not know, sir, but one day you will tax it. <laughs> 
Okay? <laughs> and of course, he was damn right, right? Um, and the other example, yes? No, really? Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah? And that was a joke that somebody told about the taxes. Oh, really? That you're repeating, yes. And he said, of what you Well, maybe Paul should give this talk then. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can correct me. That's right, William, right, right. William should give it because I had this discussion with him. And All right. And Faraday was actually consciously referring to Benjamin Franklin. I see, okay. Who was the one who made the point, and it's an excellent point. Right. Why do we do research if we don't know what it's going to grow into? Right. Well, anyway, it's, uh, so thank you. Um, and, and please interject with more uh, corrections of more historical errors. This one, I think, is right. <laughs> that, um, of course, I don't think any of us were around so, when he was saying this. So anyway, uh, it sounds like something you would have said. The, the other example uh, physicists talk about a lot is quantum mechanics. Right? So quantum mechanics was something that uh, people started wondering about because when you did t calculations about how much energy came out of an oven, you got the answer infinity. <laughs> And that bothered people, and they started trying to figure out uh, um, what was going on so the answer wasn't uh, infinite. And eventually, in the mid-1920s, maybe a group of 10, 15, 20 people working very hard on very esoteric-seeming problems figured out this revolutionary new uh, picture of, of the world that, uh, that, however, explains everything about the ordinary matter around us and eventually led to exquisite control and the, the ability to engineer materials that do amazing things, transistors. Uh, uh, people often say between 30% and two-thirds of the world GDP today is a direct consequence of our understanding of the world given by quantum mechanics, something that could not be further from the minds of the people who developed the subject uh, when they were doing it in the, in the, uh, in the early part of the century. Uh, Einstein's development of special relativity, exactly the same thing, right? He was thinking about space and time and what happens to different observers and relative motion relative to each other. And the end consequence of this was, again, something that everyone thought they understood, this hunk of matter sitting here, right? It has a <laughs> truly massive amount of energy, okay? Uh, and the fact that it has a truly massive amount of energy and equals mc squared is a consequence of the unification of space and time and that led to atomic bombs and atomic power and, you know, uh, a massive, massive uh, impact on all of the history of the 20th century, starting from very basic questions about motion, right? So, um, uh, people also refer to the fact that, that Einstein's development of general relativity, the idea that space and time are curved and that has something to do with gravity, uh, is uh, necessary and that, uh, and that clocks and gravitational fields tick at slightly different rates and, uh, and and all sorts of kind of abstruse things are now daily used by GPS uh, in order to accurately track where we go. If we didn't know about the corrections uh, to, uh, that, uh, uh, that are given to us by general relativity, we would literally lose track of where we were and not, being, and not, being, and not be able to uh, use this thing that we're all using um, daily. Um, uh, particle physicists also like to talk about the fact that the World Wide Web was developed at, at CERN in the late 1980s, uh, partially, as, uh, as, uh, uh, partially to, to deal with the fact that experimental particle physicists had to learn how to share massive amounts of data with uh, each other. And uh, this is something that physicists don't even think for a moment to patent or anything like that. They're part of the culture of science is that anything you discover is instantly public, is instantly the property of all of uh, humanity. And, um, and uh, pushing the envelope leads you to develop uh, ideas and uh, technologies that'll be extremely useful. Mathematicians like to talk about sort of elementary, but sort of deep facts about number theory being extremely important for cryptography. And even more interestingly to me that these very abstruse things about what things are computable and not computable and the ideas going back to Kurt Gödel and going through the hands of Alan Turing and Johnny von Neumann and other people led to the development of the computer, some totally practical thing that began life again from uh, extremely theoretical abstract uh, questions, um, sometimes going back to the foundations of mathematics. So I think these are all perfectly good arguments. These are all very, very good arguments. Many people know them. I've, uh, 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 I've, there, are, there are many others. Um, but I think there's certainly no a priori guarantee that this is going to keep happening over and over again. And in fact, you can look back to any one of these examples and kind of come up with a local reason why sort of it was exceptional in this case, 
that, uh, that, it, that it happened to uh, work out. For example, take the incredible success of quantum mechanics that we just talked about. Well, you could say it's true. It's true that these people were studying you know, uh, abstruse questions about, uh, about the behavior of atoms and so on. But after all, the stuff they were trying to understand was ordinary matter. You know, and the experiments that needed to be done were sort of little experiments that you could do on, on uh, tabletops. And I like to say that before quantum mechanics, we didn't know why grass is green. We didn't know why water is wet. <laughs> there was all kinds of sort of basic facts about the world around us we didn't know. And so it's not so crazy that when you're sort of understanding that, you're going to get control on the matter around you. And that could indeed revolutionize the world. Uh, and yet, it's far from obvious that the same thing would be true when, if you discover something new at a particle accelerator, which, again, costs the, uh, you know, takes the, the power of a small city to run, maybe produces some new particles that live like that and uh, disappear. It's not so obvious that that's going to, uh, that, uh, that, that that's going to give you something that might lead to some spectacular new technology. In fact, I cannot, at the moment, think of a sort of direct I'll, I'll mention a couple of uh, uh, speculative things. It's possible, it's consistent with the laws of physics, that we might see some transformative new things coming out of accelerators, but there's no particular reason to expect that some new thing or particle or something that might come out uh, might lead to a technology that would change everything. Um, and indeed, I, I find that all of these discussions about the sort of point of basic uh, science revolve around these two poles. One poll is we do it because of wonder and curiosity because we're human, which is the best answer. Okay? And the other poll is that, well, somehow, magically, it gives rise to spin-offs. And we don't quite know how, but look, it's happened over and over again in history. And again, while I think these are perfectly good arguments, what I would like to do is offer a sort of more extreme things in both directions. <laughs> okay? So first, um, I want to speak a little bit more directly and concretely about the economic uh, impact of uh, basic research. And again, let me talk about an example I know something about uh, in the context of, um, of uh, particle accelerators. Something that many people say is that, and many people have said, is that, look, this is a bottomless pit of money. You throw in billions of dollars. Who cares? Nothing, nothing interesting comes out. Um, uh, but in fact, big anything, big science like big anything, has the possibility of big return on economic investment, too, just by its bigness. Um, it's actually interesting. I, I, I was, uh, uh, there, there were some uh, nice arguments by a colleague of mine, John uh, Wormsley, that I saw uh, a few years ago that I, I didn't know, but I thought were, were amusing, and I think I'll relate to you. Um, uh, take, as an example, the, uh, the particle accelerator that we had in the United States before, uh, before the Large Hadron Collide. So uh, there's a machine outside Chicago, Illinois. It costs around $4 billion in the end. There's a sort of total amount of money that was spent on this uh, machine. And so you can ask, what did we get? What did America get from its $4 billion investment in the, uh, in the uh, Tevatron, this, uh, this uh, machine? And well, one really interesting thing I didn't know is that the, uh, the US Census Bureau actually puts a dollar figure worth on what a PhD returns to the economy. I didn't know there was some specific dollar number worth, but back in the early 2000s, that number was around two, two and a half million dollars. Maybe in, uh, in modern, in, in today's dollars, let's call it around three million dollars probably. And this is supposed to be uh, what is added to the economy just by the higher salary, by the, what you pay in taxes, other things. You know, and it's not physicists making up these numbers. It's the US Census Bureau making up these numbers. All right. So that's plus three million dollars per PhD. Now Fermilab trains like a few thousand, you know, 1,500 PhDs. So just that number, number of PhDs trained times three million is already a return on the investment. If absolutely nothing else, forget about everything else, right? And why? It's a big machine, big number of people, everything is multiplied, right? So if the overall effect is even slightly positive, you are multiplying a big number. Uh, to enhance the size of that uh, uh, of the uh, of the of the positive outcome, but but he mentioned all sorts of other interesting things, Con concrete interesting things like um, uh, accelerators are uh, force the development of um, and have historically and will continue uh, uh, to do force the development of magnet technology. Okay, and the reason is in order to make particles go around. In circles, you have to bend them in magnetic fields. So you have to make sort of very powerful, very stable magnets. 
<coughs> and uh, this, this, uh, this machine, the uh, Tevatron, uh, was really the first use of superconducting magnets on an industrial scale. Now, the current value of this industry, just the superconducting magnet industry, is around $1.5 billion a year. The MRI industry, uh, uh, magnetic, you know, what, what you use in hospitals and things like that, is the kind of number one user of, the, of, of, uh, of these magnets. And this industry is around $5 billion a year. So, now, no one is saying that MRI magnets wouldn't exist in hospitals and stuff like that if it wasn't for the Tevatron, or that uh, the superconducting magnet industry would not exist. It would probably exist. It would probably have succeeded in any way. But there was no doubt that they were stimulated and accelerated by the interaction with the physicists uh, at, uh, at this machine. So it's an industry that's you know, all put together between 2 to $6 billion a year. Now just think, if the, if the interaction with these guys just sped things up by half a year, Okay? The whole thing by half a year, there's $3 billion, right? plus $3 billion. There are many other things. Um, particle physics needs and has needed and will continue to need um, massive computing requirements. And the computing requirements in the 1990s, there was all kinds of interactions between Linux, Red Hat, cloud computing, all kinds of stuff with the people at the uh, Tevatron. Take the cloud computing industry itself, it's like $150 billion a year now. And just say that this interaction with the people at the Tevatron sped that up by a month. You know, just some minor thing like that. That's $150 billion divided by 10, um, divided by 20, whatever you want. This is another large return on this uh, scale of uh, investment. So, uh, so these are, I think, sort of interesting examples. When you're doing big science that's sort of pushing lots of interesting technological boundaries, you're going to interact not just with yourself, but with other, with other uh, industries. And, uh, and, um, and uh, if the net effect is positive, the multiplier is large. And so big positive things can come out of big investments. There have been analogous studies done for the Large Hadron Collider. I haven't actually studied them in detail. They're kind of sort of very seemingly, to me, conservative uh, estimates of the economic return of the LHC that argue that uh, at least the one uh, that I saw, that you got $1.2 back for every $1 that was invested in the, uh, in the uh, uh, LHC. And I'll just mention one possible example in the uh, future, again, related to this I issue about, uh, about, about magnets. The real driver of the costs, especially of the, of the a very high energy collider that might be built that's around um, uh, that would, that, would collide, that would collide protons, the, the dominant driver of that cost is, again, the, the magnet. And there are some recent interesting developments, both in basic physics, of possible interest in industry, involving new kinds of high-temperature superconductors uh, that, that use iron. Now, most of these fancy high-temperature superconductors use more brittle materials. It's kind of very interesting to see this phenomenon actually happen in something much more usable like uh, iron. This is something that industry is clearly interested in developing, something that physicists are clearly interested in developing because it could dramatically lower the cost of these things. If it could be done, if you could make these interesting new uh, iron-based uh, superconductors, if you could make them usable on an, on an industrial scale, that's very likely to be, once again, a, a multi-billion dollar industry. And once again, it's very, uh, it's very reasonable to imagine that a collaboration and interaction between the scientists and industry on this level uh, could, uh, could uh, speed things up. All right. People sometimes make other arguments. This is now not so much about, uh, not so much about doing uh, basic research versus not, but about doing, uh, this is a less interesting argument, so I don't want to spend uh, too long on it, but should we do very big science, or should we just do lots and lots of little experiments? And I find most people who make these arguments don't actually really know what they're, what they're talking about. They don't really know what experiments are like. Um, uh, I've certainly gone through myself, for myself, I'm a humongous fan of smaller scale experiments. A lot of my career in physics has been spent thinking about smaller scale experiments and what they could do for, uh, for a physics. But even if I sit there and dream and imagine every awesome small scale experiment I could do, just the scale of the cost is just totally different than that of these very big machines. So I could imagine adding all of the amazing things that could be done with small scale experiments, and maybe I would come at cost of some fraction, maybe 10, 20% of what these big, big machines cost. You might say, Isn't that, doesn't that mean it's completely pointless? You can do all these other fantastic things at a factor of 10 less than cost. So why don't you just do that and chuck these bigger things? And I would say it's like having a, you know, a bicycle and a car. 
Okay, these are different things. They're good for different things. Um, and uh, you need cars for some kind of transportation. You need, you like bicycles for others. And, you know, you can have a road bike, you can have a mountain bike, you can have, a, you know, a BMX, you can do all kinds of things. Uh, but it's kind of dumb to say, no, no, I don't want to have a car and instead I want 200 bikes, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, it's silly. It, they're just different. They're different. They're different kind of pots of money. It's not a zero-sum game. Uh, and also, there's just, uh, it's not a question in the end of whether we want to spend tens of billions of dollars of this or tens of billions of dollars on that. It's a question of whether we want to spend tens of billions of dollars at all. Okay? And if we want to spend money of this order, this order one part in 10,000 of GDP and so on, then this is the kind of science that, that, that does it. Everything else is just in a completely different category, even in, in, order, in order of magnitude. All right, so, um, so those are some of the more concrete, slightly more uh, concrete arguments in the, in, the, in the here and now about, um, about uh, economic return on uh, investment. I want to make one quick comment, um, which is that sometimes people ask, uh, could it be, maybe as we go and explore further, some incredible surprise happens that transforms everything we know uh, about uh, technology in the world? And it's an interesting exercise to try to imagine what such a thing could be compatible with what we know about the laws of physics today. And just to give you an example, I'm not remotely saying this is guaranteed, not, it's not remotely guaranteed to happen. But let's say that we, uh, let's say that we produce uh, at accelerators a new heavy particle that has electric charge and is pretty stable. Okay, so let's say we had a new, uh, we, we, and this is entirely possible. People look for particles like this. It's, it's totally reasonable. So let's say we, we produce such a particle that's, you know, a thousand times heavier than, than the uh, proton. Now, such particles would solve the world's energy problems um, because you could use them to catalyze fusion. Part of the difficulty with, uh, part of the difficulty with, with fusion is that atoms are pretty far apart. Atoms are, are, are pretty far apart because uh, the clouds of electrons around them um, are pretty big, and they sort of keep atoms pretty far apart. So in order for the nuclei to be able to run into each other, uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult. And that's what, makes, uh, that, that's what makes it more difficult to make fusion happen. But if you had much heavier charged particles, the kind of atoms that you'd make out of them would be much smaller <laughs> And it would be possible, it would draw the nuclei closer together and make it easier to have fusion. Okay? So that's, that's one interesting example. Another example are famous particles that are known as magnetic monopoles. So let's say we, we discover a certain kind of magnetic monopole. Um, these things would do the following amazing thing. It's com completely compatible with the laws of physics. Again, there's absolutely no guarantee of any sort that will produce magnetic monopoles. But let's say we did or that we found some. Um, uh, in experiments, you know, uh, marauding through, through space, um, then uh, something interesting is that the amount of efficiency in the energy that's consumed uh, is incredibly tiny compared to the energy that's actually there. So when we burn things, um, when we burn things, fossil fuels and so on, the amount of energy that's released is around one part in a million of the total amount of mc squared energy that's there according to uh, Einstein. Okay, so that's the measure of the sort of energy in the atomic bond uh, compared to the mc squared energy that's actually sitting there. Even when we do fusion, the amount of energy that's released is about a part in a thousand, between a part in a hundred and a part in a thousand of the total amount of energy that you could in principle get, okay, for a whole variety of reasons. But if we had magnetic monopoles, they could do the following amazing thing. You could throw in ordinary matter, you could throw in protons, and it would destroy the protons and come spitting out positrons, other particles, uh, and essentially convert all of the rest mass available into energy. Okay. So uh, now, again, these are just two examples. There are many others that, uh, that, that we could give, but there are crazy things out there that you might imagine running into that could transform things, at least compatible with everything we know about the laws of physics. And I'll give a more speculative example, but in many ways, I think a more plausible one for something that might happen. We talked that around 100 years ago, um, uh, uh, when people were understanding the ordinary material around them, there were all these surprises in the structure of ordinary material around them. There was Einstein's surprise that these things sitting there had a massive amount of energy, uh, and there are all the surprises of uh, quantum mechanics that led us to be able to control matter in such, a, such an amazing way. 
So what could be out there today that we're sort of taking for granted that has some properties that we might be able to exploit and understand if we understand them uh, uh, more, more deeply? Well, this was alluded to in Tom's uh, introduction. Uh, and it's maybe the like, number one thing that uh, most theoretical physic uh, physicists working in fundamental physics are, uh, think about in one way or another. We wander around through space and time. We take the existence of space and time for granted. And yet, we have lots and lots of indications that we don't understand what space and time really are. Could it be when we have some really deep understanding of what space time is that we'll find some way of controlling it in a way that we can't conceivably imagine today? Just like when people eventually understood things about quantum mechanics and matter, there ended up being ways of controlling matter in ways that we couldn't conceivably have imagined back then. It's certainly possible. And if I had to actually make a guess of the most plausible revolutionary thing that could come out of everything that our people are thinking about now on a time scale, I don't know, of centuries, perhaps, um, it would be this, that it would, it would have something to do with our, uh, our better understanding of, uh, of uh, space-time. All right, so, so much for the, uh, so much for the, uh, for what, uh, for the more direct uh, returns on investment and some speculations about uh, uh, crazy things that could happen that could transform technology. Now I want to go to the opposite direction and end with um, another set of comments, uh, just about why it is, in fact, that pursuing basic, uh, basic research into uh, fundamental science has been successful over and over again. Is it true that it was an accident in this case? In that case, you can come up with different excuses why it was true uh, in all the different cases. And I don't think it's an accident. I think there's actually a deep reason for it. And the deep reason for it is that uh, by asking these questions about uh, basic science, we're letting nature teach us. Nature is better at posing challenges than humans are. And not only that, it, uh, it poses an incredibly tough um, uh, challenges, but not only that, it's not cruel. Interacting with nature and interacting with these questions um, lets us interact with something much bigger than much bigger than ourselves, much grander than ourselves, much more talented than ourselves, and um, it leads us to things, uh, amazing things that we can discover that are not intrinsically within ourselves as human beings, but have to be sort of taught to us by this thing that we're studying. That's the main fundamental difference, I think between the pursuit of basic science and many of the other amazing things that are going on, uh, which have more immediate consequences. Uh, you actually see this uh, uh, today, especially in modern times, when we have, um, sort of technocratically, we have such infinite faith in human abilities, human ingenuity, human potential. And that's what we talk about all the time. But you know, those of us who work in fundamental science know that human ingenuity and potential and talent is nothing. It's minuscule. It's tiny compared to this absolute, vast, incredible thing which is out there in the structure of the laws of nature, in the structure of the platonic world of ideas if you're a mathematician. People ask if there's really such a thing as genius in science. And the answer is, damn straight there is. And the genius is out there in the structure of the thing that we're actually studying. And everyone who's done it, everyone knows that by interacting with this thing out there, your own abilities are enhanced. You find that you can do things that you couldn't possibly imagine doing on your own, not because you're particularly great, but because you're in the neighborhood of something out there which is just so vastly bigger and better than any of us are individually, or even collectively. So I like to say that if you want to be impressed and sort of amazed by what's going on with the fantastic limits to the fantastic limits of what humans are capable of doing, go to Silicon Valley. Okay? That's about what humans are capable of doing. But if you want to know where the real magic is, if you want to know uh, where the vastly bigger power is out there, much, much bigger than what we know about as humans, that's what we uncover. That's what we struggle with in, um, in, uh, in doing basic research. So. Related to this is the fact that doing this work necessitates working on hard problems for very long periods of time. And I think that's something else which is extremely important for, for the world. I mean, the world has all kinds of very long-term problems. And it's not obvious how to go about attacking a problem that seem impossible to solve that might take decades to actually uh, make progress on. Given that that's the case, it's important to have some group of people 
who've been doing this for centuries. This is, you know, this is par for the course. Those of us who work in, uh, in fundamental basic research, this is, this is our life. You work on something for decades, you have no idea whether it'll end up being right or wrong. You're a part of this huge, long intellectual tradition of people who have worked on incredibly difficult problems that seem impossible to solve. And you don't just sort of sit around and read in a book, how do you go about solving impossibly hard problems? You don't do that. You need a small group of people who actually keep doing it, and you learn from them by osmosis. Okay? And it's really important to have some group of people out there who are doing that. It's a template for how to go about doing this, when, which is important for all sorts of other problems that we have and increasing problems we have that seem to uh, require concentration and attention for um, long periods of time. Um, the people who, who work on these things are driven by a cause, again, uh, and by a calling that's much bigger than themselves. And I think it's another wonderful uh, aspect of this template, is it shows an example of how you can bring people together with a common cause, with a common calling, without homogenizing them. It's one of the most interestingly diverse uh, intellectually diverse groups of people in the world, they all are drawn by the same kinds of, uh, of uh, questions without all becoming identical to each other. Far, far from it. In fact, that's one of the most exciting things about it. The number of great physicists or mathematicians, uh, the, the number of ways of being a great physicist or mathematician is equal to the number of great physicists and mathematicians. It's an incredible fact that talent space is infinite dimensional, <laughs> and, uh, and you find people occupying talent space in all sorts of different ways. And yet, they're all sort of doing the same thing. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's, a, it's another aspect of this template for how we can go about attacking, uh, attacking uh, uh, long-term difficult problems by figuring out how to bring groups of people together without homogenizing them. And so the final thing I'd, I'd like to end with, um, really uh, coming back, zooming out to 100,000 feet um, and talking about the point of basic research is, I, to me, the, 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 the point of basic uh, uh, fundamental research in science is not decoupled from the point of life. Um, we, all have, we all have a miraculous beginning. We all have a tragic end. And much of the modern Western world revolves around distractions, distractions from this tragic end and from thinking about this, this tragic end. But uh, if you're even slightly thoughtful, it's very hard to be distracted uh, by it for too long. What is the point of it all? Um, and to me, anyway, what ultimately matters are, uh, given this sad fact, what ultimately matters are anything that we can do that somehow transcends uh, our own finite mortality. In this room, on many occasions, I have, uh, uh, I have given the following great quote of one of my intellectual heroes, uh, Steven Weinberg who said that the effort to understand the universe is one of the very few things which lifts human life a little above the level of farce and gives it some of the grace of tragedy. And I believe it, and it's beautifully said. I couldn't say it better myself. Uh, there's another wonderful quote uh, roughly along the same lines, a little less ostentatious, but still, still quite lovely, by the, the great mathematician Karen Ullenbach, who just won the uh, Abel Prize a little earlier uh, this year. Um, she said of her life in mathematics, that have been saved from boredom, dourness, and self-absorption. One cannot ask for more. Okay? And I think there is something deep in both of these, in both of these, uh, in both of these statements. Um, let me just uh, end by saying, um, shouldn't our fellow citizens, you know, listening to this, shouldn't they be skeptical? I think it's totally reasonable to be skeptical. Uh, you say, okay, this is all very nice, but it sounds like you're a bunch of people sitting around dreaming things. No one holds you accountable. You don't have to produce anything. You don't have to make anything happen. Great life if you can get it. Nice job if you can get it. You know, I actually have to sit there busting my ass, and you sort of sit there in your office day, day, daydreaming all the time. Um, that sounds like bullshit to me, right? That, uh, um, I think they're right to be skeptical. They're right to be skeptical. And I was having this discussion with some of the uh, graduate students uh, uh, earlier this week uh, that I think it's absolutely ridiculous, an incredible privilege and kind of miraculous that institutions like this and other institutions around the world exist that let this kind of thing happen. It's by no means axiomatic that they should exist. And I thank my lucky stars every single day that they do. We all have little complaints and foibles and this and that, but for Christ's sakes, it's just absolutely incredible that, that, that they exist. It's a small miracle, and we should be very, very thankful for it. So what should we do? What should we do as, uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, academics? Uh, all I can say is that I think we should not take it for granted, but 
Even more importantly, we should try to keep it extraordinary and special. Okay? And we should not let, and there's a, there are lots of forces in society that try to make academia just like another kind of job, another kind of industry, another kind of thing which uh, normal people do. We are not normal people in this business. We should not be normal people because we have this ridiculous privilege that we get to do these crazy things with our lives. And so what we have to do is earn it. And what earning it means is we have to work our asses off. And we have to be uncomfortable all the time. And we have to seek out people who make us uncomfortable too. And we have to try to, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, we have to constantly question what we know, what other people know, and, um, and, and somehow, uh, at least for ourselves, convince ourselves that we're working as hard as we possibly can to actually be worthy of this sort of great honor of these institutions existing for letting this kind of uh, research happen. Right? So anyway, that's all I wanted to say. As I said, had I, I used slides, it would have taken three times as long. This already took longer than I thought. But, um, but uh, I'll end it at that. But that was the sort of context I wanted to set. And now we don't have quite as much time as I thought, but maybe we can have some uh, questions and uh, discussion. My own fault. Sorry. So please, uh, any hard-hitting, brutal questions or not, uh, but I'll, 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 I think since it's being recorded, I will repeat the question. So just yell it out. I will repeat the uh, question. And if anyone else, uh, if Paul wants to say I'm wrong again, uh, please. <laughs> if anyone else wants to make comments, uh, I'm really hoping, this is an experiment. Maybe it'll fail spectacularly, but I hope we can actually have a discussion. Yes? Yes. Okay. The the question is, if we're such a freak show, um, maybe I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, if we're such a freak show of people who care about weird things, is there any hope that we can convince people to uh, keep funding us? Well, first of all, there clearly is a hope because I've been doing it for a few centuries already, which is pretty awesome. Okay. But but beyond that, I think uh, I think um, I have much much more faith in our fellow people than uh, somehow. Uh, at least some uh, uh, academics do. I think people understand. People understand that there should be some tiny group of people, and it's not, that's what I was emphasizing in the beginning. We're not some enormous fraction of the, either the intellectual or the financial pie. But we are a fraction that has a tremendous amount of freedom, and so long as we can show the world that we are treating this freedom like the sort of precious gift it is, and we're working really hard, and we're really committed, and it's very intense, then I think people will be cool, great. Go for it, okay? And that's certainly the sort of sense that I get talking, talking to uh, people. What we should not do is make it seem like, you know, we're sort of pretending it's one thing, but really sitting on our asses and not doing much and, uh, you know, having pointless internal discussions and uh, devolving into kind of stupidity, right? Because I think the second we lose, the second we lose our purity of purpose, the second we lose our singularity, our singularness, then then we're screwed onto the Lord. Okay? So, yes? So, my question is how, how much should we fight back, sort of holding back on like our crazier of ideas or like pursuing things that might be hard to get funding for? How do we fight back against them not wanting to fund it or things like that? Yeah, so the, the, the question is how do we. Um, if I paraphrase, uh, there are some people who might have really crazy ideas that seem very far from the mainstream. No one wants to fund them. No one wants to do uh, anything about them. How can we fight back against that? How, we can, how can we make uh, more funding for things like that happen? For example, right? That's, uh, uh, well, is that, a, is that yeah. yeah. Some of them might be good, absolutely. And uh, this is a very interesting question. There is no obvious answer to this question, first of all. Okay? And, and as a general fact of life about most of these questions, there's not a very obvious answer to them. I will say the following thing, which is that there are definitely examples of crazy ideas that have been right. Absolutely no doubt. For every crazy idea that's right, there is a thousand that are wrong. And for every normal idea that's right, there's a thousand that are wrong too. Almost everything is wrong. Okay? <laughs> Uh, that's, that's, that's life, and so you have, you, have, you have to do that. Now, you shouldn't bask in the glory of failure, uh, but you should recognize you're going to fail many, many, many times. So I think it's not a bad thing to have some degree of risk associated with doing crazy things. 
and it's fine. And you know, you should know, especially if you're a young person, if you've somehow gotten into doing you know, fundamental science with the idea that it's some sort of safe, nice thing to do with your life, you're crazy, you're wrong. It's not safe, it's risky, right? And you're risking the most important thing you have, which is your life and your time uh, uh, to uh, pursue things, okay? So it's a big risk and you should know it. And because of that, and because I think everything is risky and should be risky, I, I, I'm actually a little bit sympathetic to being conservative about certain kinds of funding. Because you know, if you're going to go big and risk big, well, then something spectacular might come out, and, you'll, and, and the rewards will be similarly spectacular if it works out. But I'm not so much, uh, I mean, uh, we can make all kinds of complaints about the funding system for science and this and that. There's all sorts of uh, more detailed things that I think are sort of not so great about the system. But this particular thing, should we just say that every, every idea is on an equal footing, the more conservative ones, the more radical ones, it's not true. Mostly conservative ideas are right because science works very well still, right? And, uh, and, so, um, and so if you're going to go further out, on the tail of craziness, well, you should realize you're taking a bigger risk, and if it, if it pays off, then, then you'll get uh, then, you know, all the joy and any other kind of more practical reward you get out of it will be similarly bigger. And this is a very important risk, you know, even sort of pragmatically, if you're a young scientist, uh, uh, there's, an, there's an interesting interplay all the time. Should you work on sort of more ambitious, slightly crazier ideas, or on the things that most other people are working on? There isn't, again, a clean answer to this question. But it's true that if you go a little bit further than other people and something works, even a little bit, poof, you are lifted out of the masses <laughs> and you will have a wonderful academic life after that. <laughs> okay? because, because nothing, academics, especially physicists, mathematicians, like nothing more. The greatest thing that can happen is some slightly crazy or even really crazy idea actually ending up being somewhat right. Okay? So, um, so there is not some cabal of establishment people looking down their noses at weirdo ideas. Quite the contrary. You know, you really want to see some shit disturbing people, but who are actually not full of crap and who, you know, are able to make some positive things happen out of it. Yes? Um, you might be right. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about sort of my own, um, uh, uh, my own experience. Um, uh, I would say that, uh, that I've known uh, a tremendously radically different set of group of wonderful scientists who are wonderful in totally different ways. And um, could we be drawing on a much larger fraction of the population? Could we have... Uh, could we have many more women? Could we have many more people uh, from other ethnicities and so on? Absolutely. Uh, um, uh, uh, is this something that would be good for science? Absolutely. Do we want talent more than anything in the world? We're starved for talent. We want talent more than anything else. So um, are there systemic things that, uh, that can or can't be done to make this better or easier? That's a much more difficult question. I don't, I don't have any particularly new or interesting things to uh, say about. But what I was referring to, even given all of that, if I had to pick, and again, as academics, we like to complain a lot, uh, but if I had to pick one community of people in the world that has uh, a, a, the sort of largest fraction of strange, eccentric, interesting sort of brilliance in it, it would be the community of people that we find in uh, universities. I should say it's not nearly high enough. Okay? It's not nearly high enough. I think most academics are very boring people. Uh, uh, sorry, I mean, it's not, so I'm not saying anything about any of you uh, in, in the detail, but it's not, it's not fantastic. It's not like most of them. I don't like most of them. I, I, I could give a crap about most of them, okay? But it's still a much bigger fraction than sort of anywhere else uh, that I know of, sort of collectively. So I think we could be doing a lot better on increasing, you know, the number of weird people that we actually have. We need more strange and weird people, many, many more of them. And so actually, what I, what I personally want to fight for is, is uh, enlarging the kind of group of, of uh, sort of strange people that we allow in, into our mix. I find too much of a certain kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, homogeneity. Um, and, you know, there's many other problems that, 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 that we have, but that's one particular thing I think I, I, I can personally do something about because I know a lot of weird people. And, uh, <laughs> yes?
Yes. Yes, yes. This isn't the first time either. Like when the hydrogen bomb was on the horizon, there were right. people who were worried it was mm -hmm. a giant atmosphere, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they went ahead and it didn't happen. Yes, yes. And I remember when the LHC was on the horizon, there were people who were worried it would make a black hole and then mm -hmm. appear, and they went ahead and it didn't happen. So uh, how many yeah. times, you know, how many strikes do you have? How many times None of those were strikes. None of those were strikes, actually. So let me, let me, let me, let me try to explain. None of those were strikes. I mean, uh, we, we could talk about this. Uh, we could talk about this at some length. But first, let me tell you the right answer. None of those were strikes. Okay? It's possible to make completely reliable estimates for how likely any of those things are, and they're so ludicrously unlikely. Um, I mean, we can't say anything. Uh, I remember uh, there was a big discussion about this before the before the, the Large Hadron Collider turned down, and. Um, and uh, many of us were sort of shocked, because uh, even if the LHC produced black holes, even if it did all sorts of other, it violated all the other known laws of physics it would have to do for it to potentially cause problems, then had it done that, it would have already destroyed all the neutron stars in the universe. It would have done other things that we would have known about already. So sort of we knew with incredibly high confidence that these things uh, would not happen. And yet I remember I had a, I had a great discussion with uh, uh, Dennis Overby, I think it was, of the New York Times. I had kind of a 45-minute phone call with him where he kept asking me, he kept giving me answers, and he kept saying, are you really sure, are you really sure, are you really, really, really sure? And I told him at the end, I said, look, Dennis, we're not really, really sure of anything in science. We don't know anything for a fact. We talk about degrees of confidence and certainty, but we don't know anything for the fact. On top of everything, the universe is quantum mechanical. So I told them, there's always some probability that the Large Hadron Colliders will produce dragons that'll eat us up. Okay? <laughs> and, that, then, and he ended up using that quote in the article. <laughs> so there were serious discussions about dr dragons. And you know, I mean, it was clearly a joke, but anyway. But it's true. I mean, there is some tiny probability that the, uh, uh, of uh, anything happening. <laughs> But no, I mean, in, 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 in Syria, and the thing about, about, about monopoles, we can control where they are with magnetic fields. It's not, uh, it's not you can make bottles that uh, keep them and uh, so on. Anyway, we could have a lo lots more discussions about this. But rest assured, no one has said, well, let's just go ahead and do it anyway and see what happens. Oh, thank God we didn't destroy the universe this time. <laughs> you know, trust me, that, that we, you know, just, I, I swear, it's not, yes. Yes. Yes, yes. How is this affecting the landscape of future fundamental research? Yeah, it, it, so the, the question, again, if I can paraphrase, um, is that there are all kinds of um, other industries that are offering money, perks, great life, um, for doing similar things than, than what you do, right, uh, um, in, in, in science. So how do we compete against that? And uh, I don't think it's actually a new problem. Uh, versions of this sort of issue have existed uh, forever. And it's very simple. There are people who, you know, there are people who really, at some level, care about money and having a comfortable life, and there are people who don't. And the people who don't will do basic science, and the people who do will do that. Uh, I don't think it's any particularly different than it's ever been, been before. After all, it's just money. Yeah, big deal. And I don't think it's particularly different. I mean, it's, uh, things like this have been going on for a long time. Yes? So the question is, how much should we be willing to, uh, uh, to let political factors or maybe bend our principles a little bit or something? I'm paraphrasing again, but something like that. Very difficult question. I don't know the answer. Um, uh, I, the, the, I don't think there is a particularly obviously correct answer. You can, you can be obviously uh, pointlessly extreme about it. Um, I guess I would say that, uh, that the, the general thing I would say is that and it's not just about this question, it's sort of more, more broadly, uh, that uh, for any sort of complicated issue like this that you face, you should always be skeptical 
of yourself, of a choice that you make that absolves you of doing anything difficult. <laughs> okay? So, uh, you know, if, if, if there are some sort of maybe difficult choices uh, to make, or you can say, no, I'm a hyper-principled person and I won't do anything, be slightly skeptical of that. Because, um, uh, because it's, always, it's always better, I think, to be um, uh, in some difficult situation where you're actually trying to do something than to find an excuse for doing nothing. Yes? That's the whole point. Please, be heretical. No, it's Earth Week. Yes. Are you familiar with Judith Curry? I am unfortunately not. Okay, well, you should be familiar with Judith Curry. Judith Curry is, um, I think she's a geologist, okay. And she has, is just brilliant in pointing out how all these so-called pure academics, Jew and science, have been terribly influenced by all the politicians Al Gore and people like that who pushed for um, answers for so-called, you know, all the climate stuff, which a lot of it is just politically motivated. So I, I totally disagree with you that it's here's the pure people and there's the contaminated people. I didn't call anyone contaminated, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> you just did though. <laughs> Well, I, I, uh, th this, is, uh, this is an interesting discussion we could have about uh, a different subject than the subject that I was talking about. Because, um, uh, because, uh, because uh, I think that uh, there, is, there is very little in the kinds of questions that we were, that we were talking about, certainly in the fields that, uh, that I work in, but also sort of uh, adjacent ones. The kind of things we're talking about don't seem to be, that's the whole point, they don't seem to be even of any sort of practical potential use now, 10, 20, you can't even imagine what they would be good for. That's what I was talking about. Um, and I was trying to argue why it's, why it's good to do them anyway, and, and the reasons it's good to, uh, to do them. Um, there are other things which are more influenced by politics for, 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 uh, for good or ill, um, but uh, I, can, I can assure you that, uh, that, that neither Al Gore nor Donald Trump nor anyone else is looking over my shoulder as I solve my partial differential equations. They don't particularly <laughs> care. Uh, uh, Yes. Uh, the question is, would I uh, classify physicists within the community of uh, artists as people who pursue something between the known and, and the unknown or as something else uh, entirely? Um, I mean, obviously there's lots of very detailed and profound differences between what some artists do and what, uh, and what uh, uh, scientists do and physicists do. But actually, in this, in this very room, on many occasions, I have talked about the very deep fundamental similarity between them, um, which r is related to exactly what you're, uh, what you're uh, talking about. And actually, I find a, a very deep kind of commonality I mean, uh, in, in, in the way I, I think about life and, you know, what, what goes into my head when I wake up in the morning and what sort of drives me, uh, and some artists, definitely not all, um, but some novelists, some composers. Um, uh, I had a wonderful discussion many, many years ago at the uh, Museum of Science in London with Ian McEwan, um, and uh, um, I think he's a phenomenal, phenomenal novelist, uh, one of my favorite no novelists in the, in the English language today. And it was a wonderful discussion. And, uh, and I think, um, uh, I, I suspect that the way a novelist gets up and thinks about the world is not particularly different in a very deep way from the way uh, a theoretical physicist goes around uh, thinking about the world. Particularly this idea that there's something out there that, that we're sort of uh, struggling to bring out that's not really in us, but is out there that's telling us what to do next. Um, at least seems to be in, in common. 
um, with some stripes of, uh, of, uh, of uh, artists. And the last time, or the second, anyway, one of the times um, uh, I was here, uh, I had, uh, uh, I, I talked at some length about something that just blew me away, which was a, um, uh, and you can find it on YouTube, uh, it, was, uh, it was a sort of half hour presentation on the first movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony that was given by Leonard Bernstein sometime in the late 1950s. And it was absolutely stunning that the way he talked about Beethoven's great accomplishment, you, you could just transpose you know, Bernstein's words, Bernstein's words with Steven Weinberg's words about the structure of the inevitability and the laws of nature. And the similarity was astonishing to me. I mean, they're like almost identical. And one was talking about the theoretical physics and the other was talking about Beethoven. Yes? Of course not. Yes. Yeah, the, 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 the question is, what's the actual human individual motivation, right? Right, well, I, 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 I thought, uh, I, I hope I made this point clear, uh, certainly both in the beginning and the end of my, uh, my uh, comments, is that uh, we do these things because of some very deep, innate human desire, um, a fascination that often goes back to uh, childhood, um, about something about this incredible world that we uh, live in. Duh. I mean, that's why we, uh, we do it. There's no other reason to, uh, to do it. Um, and uh, uh, I think, may but maybe one, one relevant comment um, uh, along these lines to make, we can keep extolling the virtues and wonders of this, and we all agree, and it's cliche, and like many cliches, it has a great, fantastic kernel, uh, kernel of, uh, of truth in it. Um, one thing uh, I would say, and it's related to some of the other questions that, 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 that were being asked, is that, uh, that's a very powerful thing. You know, you're a kid, you look out at the incredible, amazing night sky, you wonder how things work. Phenomenal. That's this great, massive, powerful, driving thing. It's also a blob. It's not well-formed, right? It doesn't actually, you know, it's the origin of all the power, but it needs to get sharpened into a tool that lets you, lets you actually do something, right? That's what education is about. That's why you go to undergrad and you go to grad school and you learn actually how to do things, right? How to actually solve concrete problems. These great, huge questions draw you in, but then if you're, if you're a professional doing anything, if, certainly if you're a professional scientist, you can't just gape in awe at the grandeur of it all. You actually have to do something, right? And you have to figure out what some little problem is that you can work on that allows you to make some progress towards these uh, grand, grand things. Now, there is something that's delicate in this entire process and that as you're going through it, uh, especially if you're a young person, you should pay attention to, which is that as you're sharpening yourself down to be able to do something, you don't want to lose contact with this big, powerful blob that drew you in to a begin with. Okay? And so you should be able to, I like to say, zoom in and out from any problem you're working on, anything you're doing, you should be able to zoom in to the actual detailed thing that you're doing, the factors of two and your fights with your collaborators and all of that. And you should be able to stop and say, now I'm going to zoom out. Let me keep zooming out. Do I still care? Do I still care? Do I still care? Do I still care? <laughs> right? And if at some point you stop caring, before you get way back out to the things that drew you in, you should stop and do something else. Okay? So it's an absolutely crucial thing to be able to zoom in and out from the sharp, specific, trained, professional thing that you're doing to the childlike wonder, grandeur of it all. They're not orthogonal to each other, but they're not the same either. Okay? There are two different ends of one beast that's known as a scientist. Right? 
And I think you can say a, a similar statement about, uh, about you know, any other interesting uh, uh, creative pursuit. So the normal things that are said about this just mostly talk about, oh, isn't it wonderful, curiosity, that yes, yes, true, but it doesn't help you solve your partial differential equations, right? Um, uh, nor should it be that you're just a monkey solving equations, you don't care about anything, right? So they have to be connected to each other. The difficulty is to make sure they're constantly connected to each other. And one slightly brutal thing we do sometimes in, in educating people is sort of, you know, is, is chop off the connection to the, to the grand source of blobby wonder to begin with. It has to be there. It's one part of it, and then there's the sharp part that's actually the tool doing something on the other, and you have to have them connected to each other. Yes? Uh, how much do you think is the role of like, uh, popular science presenters in, in, the, in the things that we are talking about, that you need like, money and you need to convince people? And do you think there's like a, <coughs> among, the, <coughs> among the academics, there's like a, a pejorative sense to the word that some academic is a popular science presenter? Uh, so the uh, question is, how important is the popularization of science? to getting funding and you know, convincing governments and so on to give us money? And is there some pejorative still among scientists to people who do uh, popularization? And, um, and uh, the answer to the first question is how important is I honestly don't know. Um, uh, the naive answer is it's very important. Okay? And, uh, and um, certainly mo many people think it is, it is uh, very important. Um, uh, um, it may be very important. I, I can only speak from my own sort of personal experience. For me, personally, it played zero role in getting me interested in science as a kid. Like, zero role. Okay? Um, uh, what, I, what I was personally drawn into science by were actual facts, concrete things. That The single thing that got me into physics was understanding how to calculate for myself the escape velocity of a particle from planet Earth. I thought it was just the most amazing thing that you could use Newton's laws to get this formula that got you the number 11 kilometers a second all by your lonesome without anyone telling you, right? And, and so any fancy book and stuff like that was nothing compared to this sort of concrete little, little thing for me. But it's, it may very well be different for uh, 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 different people. And certainly it's a good idea. Uh, I think naively it's a good idea, for sure. Okay? So uh, the second question is, is it pejorative somehow? And I don't think it is anymore. I mean, um, a lot of people do it. There is a, there is a, there is a, there is a, even a sense that that um, it should be part of what uh, what academics and researchers do. Now, I personally don't think it should be part of anything. Not because I think it's good or bad, but because I think the number one thing academics need, needs is utter and complete freedom to do anything the hell they want. <laughs> okay. So whatever they want that they're good at, that they're especially good at doing, should be what they do. If they enjoy doing these things and exciting people about science in the world, fantastic. If they want to sit there in their office and plug away on their tiny little problem, fantastic. Freedom, freedom, freedom. The most important c commodity we have in, uh, in, uh, in, in any academic pursuits. Um, but, uh, but I think you're asking a sort of a sociological question about what, uh, about what sort of field thinks about people who popularize things. And it definitely does not seem to be the way it was you know, 30 or 40 years ago, where the only people who were not sort of frowned upon uh, to popularize were Nobel Prize winners. Okay? So lots of other people popularize. Some of them do outstanding jobs. And uh, so it probably has a very positive effect. Yes? You talked about uh, uh, the return of investment of doing fundamental uh, science. So how do you think that compares to uh, you know, allocating those kind of resources into something else? And I'm not talking about uh, smaller scale experiments. Or yes. Like Yeah, uh, the, the, the question is, even if we grant that there is some positive return on investment uh, to, to basic science, how do we know that if we invest the same money in other things, that there won't be an even more positive return on investment there? The answer is we don't. Okay? Absolutely don't. Maybe you could have an even bigger positive return on investment if you do something else. Probably you would, actually. right? It, again, it has to do with whether it's the, the thing you ultimately care about is the money. If what you want to get is more money, Take your $10 billion and invest it in some other thing, you'll probably get more money if you let the right people do the investing. Right? I'm, uh, I, uh, just to be careful, I was not trying to say this is a great way of making money. I was just trying to say you probably don't lose money. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you probably don't lose money. You get something out, back out of it. And by the way, you advance the millennial long quest to understand the grand structure of the universe around us, too. 
But I think, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not an expert on any of these things, but I would certainly naively think uh, if you wanted to make a lot more money with the same thing, you could get much bigger return on investment doing something else, very likely. Yes. Okay, so I feel like in science there are like two kinds of questions. There are some how questions and there are some why questions. So the how questions are like how does a car work, right? And a why question like why does quantum mechanics work? So when you try to answer why questions, do you ever feel like there is an end to this? In the sense that you can make up some axioms which, ex which tell you why quantum mechanics works, but now you have to explain So the, 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 uh, the question is about the difference between how and why questions in science. And, um, uh, and my answer is I have nothing interesting to say about this, this uh, question. <laughs> um, all, all I'll say about it is I think this distinction between how and why is very artificial. And, um, uh, and very often, uh, uh, wandering around in the neighborhood of the sort of question of the level that, that you're asking um, is kind of... Uh, uh, you know, arguing about words and semantics, and you're nowhere near the trenches where stuff is actually happening. When you're near the trenches where stuff is happening, I, I guarantee you, and well, you're, a, you're a student, so you probably know this, you don't give a crap about whether it's how or why or whatever the hell. You have no idea what the hell is going on, but something amazing is happening, and you're trying to understand it. And only after it's all done do you know whether what you got in the end was a how or a why or something else, right? Um, there is no prejudgment or pre-idea of what it is that we expect when we, when we go into the frontiers, and that's one of the aspects of the uh, excitement of it. But this particular kind of quasi-philosophical question is extremely pointless. Uh, and um, it's extremely pointless because it's very far from anything that's actually meaningful and, and happening. And when something does happen, and after it's kind of well enough understood, you can sort of step back and figure out if you, what, what exactly it is that, that you've learned. But it's very hard to tell uh, before you have the answer. Something I like to say all the time is in, in all kinds of uh, basic fundamental science, we often have to be in possession of the right answers before we know what the question is that we answered. <laughs> okay? And the cart goes before the horse all the time. And you cannot have this cookie cutter method. I learned the method of science in grade seven is first you make a hypothesis and then you do an experiment to check the hypothesis. And then if the experiment is wrong, it falsifies the theory, you go back to step one, you create another theory, you do another experiment. It's so stupid, okay? <laughs> Nothing is like that. Nothing ever works like that. Vastly more chaotic, vastly more interesting, vastly more confusing, and vastly, uh, vastly, um, uh, uh, less time to contemplate these sort of dumb philosophical questions. Sorry to call your question dumb, but... Uh, <laughs> You're really preaching to the converted on this one, I promise you. <laughs> if, you come, if, you, if you have to suffer through any of my lectures in physics for the last 10 years, I've spent you know, hours with this analogy. So it's a, yes, please, please. And we didn't really have any idea even that there was a why behind that how. Right. We would be friends in, in, another, in another life, you know, like, <laughs> I agree 100% with this, and as I say, if you've suffered through any of my lectures, I go on and on and on and on about this particular analogy. Oh, I wouldn't make, he's a wonderful guy, I didn't make him sound silly at all. No, uh, no, what, what I meant is simply the following, is that all of these things, uh, the path to uh, thinking about them and getting there does not involve beginning by asking is it a how or a why or something else. It involves doing something concrete. So like, uh, so, so Hamilton and their friends, I don't know exactly what motivated them, but one thing that could have motivated them is looking at patterns of uh, what you get when you have uh, uh, you know, simple harmonic motion and um, looking at, at particles starting in different places and noticing that certain areas and phase space remain the same. And there's all sorts of concrete things, miraculous things about the structure of the laws that become manifest when you write down these equations in these ways. 
The path to progress is not through contemplating ahead of time whether what you're asking is how or why or this and that is vastly more chaotic. That's, that's all I was trying to say. By the time you're done, after you understand it reasonably well, you can, you can draw some lesson from it. And then it's extremely interesting to figure out if what you've done is a how or a why. And then, if you came to any of my talks over the last 10 years, you would find incredible agreement on this thing. And the rest of my colleagues there will roll their eyes at the number of times that have made this analogy. So anyway, we can, uh, we can discuss this uh, afterwards and, and improve our relationship. So. <laughs> Everybody is invited to join, and on that, let's thank Nima again.